This is Real Estate Rookie episode 294. We were making about 10 grand a month with couch flipping. On average, I would say if you're like consistent and dedicated, you could do anywhere from two to five a week. You don't want to drive 10 miles delivering $20 in food and you make a $2 tip. There's DoorDashers making $10 an hour and then there's other ones making 40 or 50. My name is Ashley Kerr and I'm here with my co-host, Tony Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. And uh, rookies, we got a great, great episode for y'all today. Uh, we've been we've been toying around with this concept in the background for a while now, but one of the one of the biggest obstacles or challenges that we hear from aspiring investors is the capital that's required to get started. And while there are certain types of real estate investing or strategies where you can get in for little to to no capital, um, a lot of times you need some cash to get started. And we thought, what better way to overcome that obstacle than bring back some previous guests from the Rookie Show and from the Real Estate Podcast who used their side hustles to fund their real estate business. So today we've got Ava Jurgens and uh, Josh Janis to come back and talk about their side hustles and how they use that to fuel their real estate business. Then at the end of the episode, we kind of break down uh, three different criteria that we have set as to how to how to kind of weigh out these two side hustles. And the first one is upfront capital, income potential, and then passiveness. What is the time commitment? And then we kind of threw in a fourth one there too as to what is the risk? How much money could you lose on this? Um, so make sure you guys listen all the way through and kind of check these out. And maybe one of these side hustles will be great for for you guys, make sure to leave a review on YouTube or wherever you may be listening and let us know if you like these side hustle episodes. Um, I think they're great for everyone listening, but also if you have kids and you want them to start making money somehow, this may be a great episode to, to have them listen to. And and honestly, that was part of how this whole episode came to be is because my, my son's 15 and, and, you know, he's trying to save up for his car right now. And uh, he's debating on these different side hustle ideas. And we thought, you know, it'd be cool to kind of kind of hear firsthand from folks. So maybe uh, maybe we'll get my son, Sean, on one of these episodes in the future as well. So he can he can interview some folks firsthand. But uh, just a, a few quick housekeeping things before we jump into Josh and, and Ava's episode. Uh, if you guys can head over to biggerpockets.com forward slash reply, uh, we've got a new uh, landing page up where you can submit your questions for the Real Estate Rookie Reply episodes. Uh, we'd love to hear from our rookie audience. It's one of our favorite types of episodes to do is to hear from y'all and answer your questions directly. And second, I got to give a shout out to someone by the username of Nico and Casey. Uh, they left us a, a really heartfelt five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, the title of their their review is My Lighthouse in the Storm. Uh, it's a very deep and, and touching title. But uh, Nico and Casey say there is so much advice out there. Most of it's contradictory for real estate investing that it feels like you're being tossed about in the ocean during a storm. There seems to be risk and the potential for losing large sums of money no matter where you decide to go. Worst of all, you feel like you are in it alone. Bigger Pockets, and particularly the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, has been my guiding light. Your advice is sound, and the guests you interview remind me that anyone can start this journey. I haven't closed on my first deal yet, but I've been making many connections in and out of state, and it's only a matter of time. Keep up the great work. Nico and Casey, probably one of my favorite reviews I've read as of late. We appreciate that. Uh, for all of our rookies that are listening, if you haven't yet, please do leave us an honest rating review on whatever platform it is you're listening to. Um, the more reviews you get, more folks we can reach, and more folks we reach, more folks we can help. Ava and Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time today to teach us about your side hustles. I want to start off with you guys telling everyone a little bit about yourself. Uh, Ava, we've had you before on the Rookie Podcast. Josh, you were on the podcast with David for the Bigger Pockets podcast. So let's jump in uh, with you, Ava. Can you start off with telling us just a little bit about yourself and what side hustle you are going to be teaching us today? Yeah. So hi, my name is Ava Jurgens. I started a real estate investing company when I was 15 with my now fiance, Ben, and we were able to acquire 900K in residential real estate before I graduated high school. And now basically, we were able to acquire a lot of real estate because of this side hustle called couch flipping, which we will talk more about today. And Josh, what about you? Hey, I'm Josh Janis. I'm 22. I am a real estate agent and investor um, based in Cleveland, Columbus, Ohio. Basically, I was uh, door dashing, as I'll talk about later, 
in college, not really knowing what my journey was going to be. And I was listening to the Bigger Pockets podcast um, and listening to all their educational material regarding financing or finances and real estate. And that led into where I am today. So Ava, you were on episode 271 of the Rookie Podcast and Josh was on episode 749 of the Real Estate Podcast. So thank you guys so much for for coming back. Uh, We want to kind of break down these side hustles. So at the end of this episode, someone listening can go out and replicate what you guys did or maybe something very similar. So Josh, how did you even hear about your side hustle? And doing DoorDash. Yeah. Um, I didn't really want to work a traditional job. I wanted to work a job where I could maybe listen to podcasts or audiobooks or do something while working to try to improve my overall education. So uh, I was just kind of Googling what like what could you do? I had a car, I had some money saved up, but I didn't have anything particular and I think like some Uber Eats ads popped up. I was like, oh, maybe I'll try that out. Josh, you know, uh, I, it's such a weird world that we live in now. Like my my wife and I, like we're, we're notorious for not cooking. Um, and like 90% of the food that we eat gets delivered by someone else. So either we're, we're Instacarting something from the grocery store or we're, we're doing DoorDash or all these other things. So it's cool that there's a, there's side hustles out there that, um, you know, that people can use to do that kind of stuff. So, um, do, so you, you, you hear about DoorDash. I mean, you're, 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 how old were you at the time when you started? Uh, like 18 or 19. I mean, as a, as an 18 or 19 year old, was there any hesitation about like, driving around your local city delivering food to to strangers like i think for a lot of people that might be part of the hesitation around doordash and i might be getting ahead of myself but like just i don't know all the interaction with strangers like was that a concern for you at all yeah i mean a little bit just navigating like figuring out where to go some people's apartment complexes or building arrangements can be complicated to somebody that isn't experienced to it i guess so that might make people nervous so let me let me ask this man what who who do you feel is like the ideal person to take up the side hustle? Like what are some of the, the skills or traits or tools that someone needs to be successful doing this? I think it's somebody that's self-driven because you really only get paid for as much as you work. But at the same time, you can be really flexible with it. You don't have to do it a set out, set number of hours or set number of days. You can like, there's always those commercials talking about it, but it's true. You know, you can kind of set your own schedule. And Josh, what made this a good fit for you? Was it the schedule or was it something else that really enticed you as to this is something you wanted to do? For sure. Um, It was definitely the scheduling because I had classes during the day and I wanted to find something that I could make money with after school or in general, like between like five and nine. I don't want to be out too late. And then I also wanted to be able to either listen to books, audio books, podcasts, et cetera. And this job allows you to do that almost the entire time. Josh, can you just explain how it is flexible? Like, how are you setting your own schedule? Is there an app you're going into and putting in when you're available to work? Do you have to like set it ahead of time? Can you just kind of give us the glimpse as to how exactly you are setting your own schedule? So certain markets, you'll actually have to set your schedule in advance because it's competitive wherever I was working, you can just log on and start working and you don't really have to tell anybody when you're going to do it. So it's kind of the ultimate level of freedom. Josh, you, 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 and you know, this isn't necessarily about the side hustle, but you talked a lot about wanting to, uh, kind of have the freedom to listen to podcasts and and all this other stuff, just out of curiosity, right? Cause you, you said you were 18, 19 at the time. What, what sparked that initial interest for you? Yeah. I've always been kind of entrepreneurial. I made duct tape wallets, sold shoes, sold virtual currency, and I kind of had some money saved up. And I didn't really know like where to take that. But I figured, you know, if I just kept jamming information in my head, eventually I'd figure something out. I love that, man. We, we got to have both you and Ava back because I know both of you guys have like multiple side hustles that you've tried. Um, next question for you, Josh, what, what was the cost of entry? Like what were the startup costs for you to, to get the, the side hustle rolling? If you have a car that's within the last 10 years, I believe that's their guidance and you have a valid driver's license um, and you have enough money to pay for gas in the beginning, that's really all you need. Um, You can borrow somebody else's car and rent it, but yeah. 
I didn't realize that, that you needed to have a car within the past 10 years. Is that just because they want your car to be reliable so that the food is actually getting delivered and there's less risk of breaking down? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I had I had a, a couple, one or two flat tires. They actually would assist in paying for, which is kind of helpful. I, so I was going to ask because I know I've heard Uber, like I've been in Ubers before where the driver says, oh, this isn't even my car. I'm renting this car from Uber. And Uber will rent you a car. They take care of all the the maintenance and the service. So just for anyone else that's thinking, even if you don't have a car, some of these like gig based things will actually give you a vehicle, and then you just have to do the work of actually actually driving it around. Yeah, and Josh, you mentioned right there that they helped you with your tires. Did they like give you money when you got flat tires, or how did they assist you with that? I believe they did credit me for a flat tire, and they also paid me for what I what I would have made if I completed the delivery. I think it was both. I could be wrong, but. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So Josh, you've started your, your gig. Were there any other kind of startup costs besides like having a vehicle and having to spend money on gas? If you buy a magnetic thing to put on your car, like buy your front windshield, that's very helpful. Uh, so you're not like constantly like looking down, uh, good, good set of headphones, have some snacks, have some water in your car and just be ready to just live in your car for a couple <laughs> hours a day. <laughs> Basically, Josh, it sounds like the the, the startup costs for this are, are relatively nothing, right? Like most people already have a vehicle. Most people already have like what they need to get started. So if I wanted to right now, I could probably start making money uh, with this side hustle tonight if I wanted to. Yeah, this the actual registration sign up was a couple days. Okay. And then Josh, once you got going, how long was it? So since that initial day, you started the sign up process, how long until you actually made your first dollar? Oh, I made money on the first delivery. So you make money right away. You don't, you get paid out once a week. So you wait a couple of days to actually get it. Um, But you need to learn like what is a good delivery to take and what isn't. So like making sure people are tipping you and things like that. But really, you get paid from day one. Yeah. How do you tell what is a good delivery or a bad delivery? I didn't even know that there was actually a difference. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's DoorDashers making $10 an hour. And then there's other ones making 40 or 50 because you have to learn how like you don't want to drive 10 miles delivering $20 in food and you make a $2 tip and it takes you an hour round trip. So but maybe you drive 10 minutes there, 10 minutes back, and you make $9 and you waited five, 10 minutes at the store. That's a lot better utilization of your time. So I think DoorDash really allows you to like learn the value of time as well. So are you able to see like when you an order comes in, are you able to see all of that information as to what the tip will be, what the where the food is that you're picking up, where you're dropping off? You'll see where it is and you'll see where it's going. They hide the tips kind of you can go on reddit and other forums and figure out how they hide it and learn it um but for the most part it's very transparent and actually every single delivery is like its own independent contract so you can either accept it or deny it and get another one presented to you oh so even after when you accept it you can see all the information and then and then you can go back and cancel it yep. and then go and take it everyone oh okay that, and does does doordash help you like optimize your your routes as you're going through this Cause you talked about like making sure that you're getting the best return on your time like does it have like a routing functionality that says you know if you're picking up multiple deliveries go here then here then here then drop off in this sequence or do you have to kind of figure that out yourself it does do that yeah if you're in an area like if you're in a city or somewhere busy it works really well if you're kind of doing it in the middle of nowhere a little bit like i was doing it's not as great but mm. yeah that's pretty cool. I don't know, Ash, I don't think I've ever shared this with you before either. Um, but, you know, I'm, I have such a colorful history. But when I was uh, in college, me and my friends had a startup and it was called Tumi, T-U-M-E-E. And this was before like DoorDash and Uber Eats like really blew up. Like they were just like early phase startups. And we were trying to essentially be the like kayak for deliveries. So if you went to to me, you would put in what you wanted and then it would give you the best price between like DoorDash, um, Postmates and like whatever the other apps were at the time. Um, We never really got off the ground. We had a really cool looking app, but we couldn't get funding. But um, I don't know, just tidbit for you to, to know more about Tony's history. Yeah, all the time you surprise us with all these ventures or jobs or different things you did. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, Josh. So uh, next question for you here, brother. How many, and this might be a silly question, but like how many people are on your team to do this DoorDash thing? Are you always by yourself? Are you like tag teaming them with a buddy? What does that, what does that look like? I had a friend that did it along with me. So we would be on calls sometimes, but the way to, the way that I grew it was I started to use multiple apps at the same time. And then once I kind of got the hang of that, I actually used multiple phones um, to get different orders and you try to line everything up. You don't want to make it like, you don't want to have people wait too long for their food. You got to be strategic with it. But if you do it right, you can do pretty well with it. Wait, so walk me through why you need multiple phones. Why can't you, why can't you do it all with one phone? Because you could potentially get two similar delivery requests on two different accounts that like maybe their one house is two miles away from the other. And you wouldn't necessarily get both of those requests like at the same time on the first phone. So you can kind of like stack deliveries that way. So it's almost like you're two people then you're signed in un- under different logins to the app. Yeah, you're essentially two people. Yeah. Yep. So what what's the what's the most number of phones you've been logged into at one time? Like are you you got like five phones that you're running around with doing No, that that'd be pretty chaotic. Just two. I think I've had six different deliveries on my car once. I think that was my max. With, all I can think about is that song. I got two Okay, well, awesome, Josh. Uh, We just want to kind of dive in and get kind of the background information on DoorDash. And now we're going to turn it over to Ava. So Ava, how did you hear about the side hustle that you chose? We found couch flipping just because we searched up on YouTube different like side hustle ideas and couch flipping just seemed like the most intriguing one. And just, you know, Ava, I think everyone understands what what like DoorDash and, and Postmates are. But for folks that maybe haven't heard of couch flipping before, can you just even define what that means? Like, what does it mean to flip a couch? Yeah, I'll just go like step by step. So the first step is you go on apps like Facebook Marketplace, OfferUp, and then you look for couches that people are selling that are just underpriced or maybe need a clean and you could sell it for higher. But then you basically just make your offer. You can lowball it just like real estate. And you get the couch, you can clean it, or if it doesn't need cleaning, you just leave it as is. But then you take really good pictures and then you upload it back on those apps for just a higher price. So you're, you're literally almost like flipping a house, but you're flipping a couch. You're flipping furniture that people have. That's wild. Um, so what, like, like who is this, uh, who is this side hustle for? Like, what are some of the skills or traits you need to be successful with, uh, with, with couch flipping? I would say, Kind of like DoorDash, you figure out what couches are going to be the most profitable and what ones just aren't worth your time. I would say it's not necessarily a skill. It's just something you learn over time. But I would say you do need to like have some muscle, have some meat on your bones (laughs) because couches are really heavy. So you definitely need to be able to lift it up. But I will say you can do it with just one person. Like you can either get the owner of the couch to help you actually get it into your vehicle or there's this like kind of hack. You just put one end up on like, if you have a truck, you put it in the truck bed and then you go around on the other side and lift the other end and just push it in. So there, it's possible to do it with just one person, but you just gotta be strong. So uh, just on, on the skill side piece, so so Josh talked about how with DoorDash, you gotta be smart about which deliveries you take and which ones you deny to make sure that you're maximizing your time and maximizing your revenue. Like is like, how do you get good at analyzing a couch? Like, how, how do you know, like, okay, this is how much this couch is going to make when I resell it on the back end? Yeah. So over time, you'll realize which couches sell the fastest. And where I live personally, everyone loves a good, huge gray sectional. I don't know what it is, but I mean, I guess they're modern and they're pretty. So we always know if we can find like a gray sectional for 200 bucks, we could probably sell it for 1200 if it's good quality, if it's big. So you like will learn over time which couches sell the best. It's different in each market. But for me personally and for a lot of like other different places in the US, gray sectionals do really well. And then you can also look at like how far away is this couch? Like is it in your city? Is it in like the city over? So drive time. And I mean also just if you have to clean up the couch, take that into account. Cause it to clean up a couch, it could take anywhere from, you know, ten minutes to an hour. For the that you know the fact that the gray sectionals go great. In the very beginning, how did you kind of do your market research as to, you know, what kind of couches you wanted to buy? Was it trial and error? Were you 
going up and seeing what things were selling for on Facebook Marketplace or offer up? How did you kind of learn what couches go for and what the true value is? Yeah. So kind of like you mentioned, we saw that, for example, like gray sectionals, they were selling really fast where we live. And also we watched a lot of YouTube videos and we knew that this one guy who couch lift a ton, he just did sectionals because they were so good. So we tried to stick to like just sectionals. And then also it's some of it's just self-explanatory. Obviously you don't want to get like a leather sectional that's ripping all over. It's not something you can't fix. So um, I guess it was a lot of trial and error, but also some strategy that you just kind of learn over time. And when you were watching these YouTube videos and you found this couch flipping online, what made you decide that this was going to be a good fit for you? Uh, mainly just because my fiance, Ben, he had a truck and he's strong. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, um, he, I mean, like he was kind of the, I won't take full credit. He was pretty much the whole driver of it. And also just, it was very attractive because it could make a lot of money. I mean, you're making anywhere from like on average 200 to $700 an hour. So it's a great like return on time. And then Ava, what's what's the cost of entry? If I wanted to get started couch flipping today, what kind of capital do I, do I need to put up to get started? So you can get couches for free or like a hundred bucks. What we did for our first one is we got it for free and we already had the truck. So it, like it didn't cost anything. But if you don't have a truck, this is where it can kind of get pricey. Um, just because you need to be able to have a car that's actually going to fit a couch because couches are huge. You got to have some way of transportation. And the only way you can like work around not having a truck is borrowing someone. Like if your grandparents have it, your relatives, any friends or renting one, or maybe like having the people deliver the couch to you. But I mean, there's a couple ways around it, but I would say having a truck is pretty important. You know, I didn't, I didn't even realize. So you're, you're saying Ava that, that at times you would find couches that people were giving away for free mm -hmm. and then clean them up and turn around and sell them. So your, your initial capital investment would be zero on those couches. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And some people like that we got them for free, they'd be really upset <laughs> because sometimes people <laughs> will message you after and you're like, this is my couch, <laughs> but yeah, you can actually do it and get like them for free. There probably are people, though, that just want to get rid of it and they'll mm -hmm. give it for free just to have somebody haul it off of their property so they don't have to dispose of it. Like where I live, there's like a town dump and they have like trash day every once in a while where you can bring like appliances, things like that. And you have to load up the trailer of all the stuff and then drive it there and take it to the dump. And like I could see if people don't have a truck, they don't have a trailer, they really don't have any way of getting it there. Plus, it's an inconvenience to have to drive there. So I could definitely see the value of finding those people that just don't want to get rid of the couch themselves, that they're willing to give it away, just have somebody haul it. You know, I just I opened up Facebook Marketplace on my phone while you're talking, Ash, and the very first couch that showed up says free. The very <laughs> first couch on Facebook Marketplace is free. So there you go. I never would have never even would have thought of that. Yeah, sometimes they're free when either they're just really bad or they need a good clean or maybe they need same day pickup or something like that. And also we've been able to get couches for free by it's just like real estate, like a fast close. You can get a discount. Same with couches, You're like same day pickup. Oh, that's like a hundred bucks off. So yeah, it's literally just like real estate. Let's go into the kind of that negotiating a little bit because with DoorDash, I you really can't negotiate. You're pretty much told <laughs> what the cost is. But as far as negotiating couches, what are some of your tactics for that? Yeah. So like I just mentioned, same day pickup is huge. People just usually like when they post it, they just want to get rid of it. So same day pickup's a great one. And you can get a couple hundred off for that um, if you're lucky. Usually it's like 50. Um, also, you can just maybe bid against other people. We obviously like in the summer, is when you'll usually get in bidding wars because everyone's like looking for new like furniture and obviously buying a new couch you're paying like a couple thousand and then on facebook marketplace you can get it for a couple hundred so a lot of people buy couches on there negotiation there's some but it's pretty much like slim to none but um one way you actually can like get more money out of people when they're buying it is like offering delivery. Cause again, not everyone has a truck. So how are they going to get it to their property? So if we deliver, we're able to like up the purchase price by 50 to hundred. So along with your startup costs, you have to, when you take these couches, it's usually you're probably not selling them same day. So do you have a storage unit that you're paying for or where do you store the couches 
until you're actually able to sell them again? So since we, that's actually a really good question. So since we started this when we were 16, we were like, so my parents' house. So we would just put all the like couches in my parking spot and I just park outside. But then my parents just got, they were like, I'm tired of these couches in my garage. <laughs> Cause like they also, sometimes they just have a stench of someone's home. Even if it's not bad, it's just, I don't know. And yeah. so they wanted them out. So eventually we did get a storage unit. And I believe our storage unit is about a hundred something a month, but you can fit a bunch of couches in ours. Like ours isn't very big, um, but we just stack couches on top of each other. And then do you offer delivery or do you have people just come right to the storage unit and pick it up? Yeah. So it just depends on how far away they are. Um, if they're like super far away and they ask for delivery, like an hour away, we usually won't do it unless we're actually like getting a good price for it. But if they're close and they really need delivery in order for it to like, you know, close, then we'll go ahead and deliver it for them. So with all of this couch flipping, what was the reason that you wanted to make this extra money anyways? Yeah. So again, since we were making like a couple hundred dollars an hour, it was a great way in order for us to make a lot of money at like as just young people in order to like invest in real estate. I talked about this on my episode a little bit, but for our first investment, we did a 50, 50 um, like partnership split with my parents. And if you add up the down payment, closing costs, and then any repair costs, and then you split that in half, my parents paid half and then we paid the other half. And then we paid our half with all our couch flip money. Yeah. So you literally use your couch flipping business to fund your first real estate purchase, which is the whole purpose of this episode is to show our listeners what's possible when you, when you get a decent side hustle that can generate some revenue. Um, so I, l- let's go back to that, that first couch, Ava, you said that, uh, that you got that first couch for free. How long did it take after you purchased that couch to actually get your, get your money back from, from selling it? So it did sell same day. And then we delivered it like the day after But um, we got it for free. And again, with the skill over time, you realize like what you can actually price it. But we just wanted to make sure we sold it. So we put it up for like maybe 200. And so on our first one, we got $200. Just like transactionally, what are you using to get the money? You like Giselle Venmo or are you like sending PayPal invoices or something? Uh, Usually it's just Venmo and then sometimes just cash. So when you did that first transaction, how much time did you actually put into it with picking up that free couch, delivering it? Did you have to clean it at all? Like how much did you make hourly for that first $200? So on our first couch, we did clean it and we, I would say it was about like an hour and a half worth of work just from, cause it wasn't too far away. So we just had to pick it up, um, clean it, take pictures. And then actually something I do want to mention is again, with the skill is over time, you'll realize like how to sell it in the description. It's just like a listing for a house. You got to like talk about in the listing, make sure you clarify things like colors. And then also always include measurements like height, width, and length, because people are always going to ask and it's just a pain to go remeasure it. So always measure it, put those in the description. Um, But I would say all in all, since it was our first one, it took a little longer. So maybe one and a half to two hours. Out of curiosity, Ava, have you found like one platform being better than the others to to list your couches? Like, do you get more interest on Facebook Marketplace or are you on offer up? Like, what are all the, the platforms that you're on and which one has been the, the, the best one for you? Yeah. So I always say you can do it on offer up and Craigslist as well, but we have only ever used Facebook Marketplace because it's the best for selling and buying. All right. So last, last question here before we, we kind of switch gears, uh, you, you, you mentioned you and your fiance, but is there anyone outside of the two of you? Like how many people do you need to make this, uh, make the side hustle of couch flipping, a a, a realistic goal for people? Um, just for our end, I, it's just one or two people, but of course you need people who are actually selling their couches, but just to actually do it, you just need yourself. And I'm obviously it's going to be easier to lift a couch with two people. So keep that in mind, but (laughs) yeah, you can do it by yourself. Awesome. Ava, thank you so much for sharing the start of your side hustle. Uh, we want to go, we have some more questions for you guys. Uh, so Josh, let's go back to you and can you recount a crazy moment? Uh, you know, maybe it was an interaction with the customer, a big order you had, or maybe something went wrong. Uh, can you kind of give us that entertainment? <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, I don't know, it was like 2 p.m. on a Tuesday or something, like middle of a work day. And I was delivering Taco Bell to this house that had a big gate. So I had the code and I got through the gate and it was like a quarter mile like driveway. And this huge house with like 
it had like a Lamborghini and a Rolls Royce in the driveway. It was absurd. I was like, why are you guys ordering Taco Bell? <laughs> I don't know. I found it really funny. You, you know what you should have did, Josh? Like, have you seen those videos where it's like the people going up to like millionaires' homes and saying, hey, what do you do for a living? Did you did you get to ask that question? I wish that was happening when I was doing this because I could have just done that also. And then maybe you had two businesses going. <laughs> there you go, man. That would have been, <laughs> that, that actually would have been a really good idea. Oh, I love that. So so you, you never had anyone that was like, I don't know, like belligerent or drunk or just like anything crazy like that where you were, you were fearful for like, where where the situation might go luckily the majority of what i was doing was during covid so actually i didn't meet too many people but i am sure there are some funny stories out there about that ava what about you uh flipping couches meeting up with people any any crazy stories about either who you sold to who you bought from anything in between yeah so there's like the small things where like couches have like we've been lifting them and they just fall down the stairs or one time actually a couple weeks ago We were lifting one and then all of a sudden we were like going out the door and their cat just jumped right out of the couch. But there was this, yeah, so we almost took their cat. But there was this one time um, we were going like into like the city downtown. And so we were, I don't know, it was kind of this like sketchy area and the neighbor's house, like we were going into the house to get the couch, but then the neighbor like I don't know what they were doing, but they were on the porch. And then all of a sudden we made eye contact and he pulls up his like AR, not like pointing it at me, but he just pulls up to show it. We just sprinted to the car and left. I, I honestly, I just couldn't. So, but um, yeah, those are the crazy stories I can think of right off the top of my head. Yeah, I guess getting a getting getting a gun pulled on using. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's one thing we didn't talk about with either of them is like pulling up to strangers' houses, and especially Eva, if you're going into the houses, yeah, to get couches. What are some ways to kind of protect yourself? Um, I know, like at this one property that I'm at right now, where I've been working a lot. Uh, we'll order groceries here because we have like a full kitchen and everything, and it's just like this very random dirt road like you know that Josh says goes back you know a quarter of a mile but this is all dirt and you know the property is overgrown there's like a haunted house looking thing at the end and you know you could tell like they're not sure if they're in the right place so like how do both of you kind of navigate as to like are there certain areas you won't deliver to Josh or Ava you won't pick up couches from for me personally like Ben's, uh, well, he always says this, Ben's a really good wrestler. So he's like, oh, I'll be fine. I'll, I'll beat him up. <laughs> like, don't worry. <laughs> so I'm always with Ben when I do it. But, you know, like he went to state every year. He's good. So I'm okay. <laughs> and Josh, what about you? Yeah, is there ever a, a door dash for like, no, I'm, I'm not picking that one up. I'm not, I'm not going there. Uh, I would utilize like the tips as a way of judging the area, right? So like uh-huh. if I'm delivering $60 in food and you're giving me like $2, it's like, I'm probably not going to go over there. That's interesting. You know, I don't even think I ever like noticed what the tip is because like DoorDash just like has like a default like tip amount. And I don't think I've ever changed that. But now hearing from a DoorDash ref, like I might need to pay more attention to that to make sure that I'm getting my fruit like delivered quickly. Right. Because like, can you can you change your tip amount on DoorDash after you've submitted your order? You can change it after I've, I've had both. Sometimes like huh. I can't open up the food. I don't know actually what's in there. And people would be like, oh, they put like onions or something on the food and then they'd like take half their tip away. And it's like, dude, I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> wow. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. All right. Let's uh, let's let's go to our next question here. What about what about longevity just in terms of how sustainable the side hustle is? So, Josh, to start with you, man, I mean, how how sustainable or how 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 I don't know, I guess, like how long do you feel you can keep up doing DoorDash as a side hustle? I think it pairs really well with like a W-2 job or something where you can work at night or maybe you don't work on a Tuesday or a Saturday morning. I think it's sustainable as as long as you want to do it. And Ava, what about you for couch flipping? I would think that maybe lifting couches may take a toll on your back eventually, but what would you say the longevity is for doing couch flipping? Yeah, I would say you can hurt your back, so you got to be careful. But um, as long as like you know, you're fit enough and you can like lift heavy objects. And also, I guess if we're talking about if you have like a job while doing this, a lot of the times, like the only downside about couch flipping really is it's not really on your own time. It's whenever a good couch pops up because they're not on there 24 seven all the time, because obviously if it's good, it's going to go fast. 
So you kind of have to be constantly like looking at your phone, refreshing the page in orders to like text a person right away, like, oh, I want this couch. So pairing with a W-2 job, I mean, you can only take so many bathroom breaks, so I don't know, but I would say it's good for the weekends and stuff. Um, but yeah, longevity wise, as long as you're good with lifting heavy objects, you can do it as long as you want. And Ava, if I remember correctly, you have a bunch of virtual assistants for your other business, but for a side hustle, do you think you could hire a virtual assistant to basically just like comb through listings every day or like have them set alerts and where you're not even having to worry about logging in and checking for all these listings? Definitely. I definitely think you can, because if you just plug in the location, like anyone can do it from anywhere. So for sure. Man, now now my head's spinning, right? Like, could I could I build like a couch flipping empire where I have VAs across every people single- People do. Yeah. <laughs> people have huge like warehouses and buy them at like wholesale. It's crazy. You should just look it up on YouTube. Well, I guess that leads into my next question. And Ava, I'll start with you on this one in, in terms of consistency of income, because you said people aren't posting couches all day, every day. So like, I, I guess, how, how many couches could you flip in like a month? Like, what's the average number- that someone could expect to do? Like, am I flipping a couch every day? Is it once a week? What, what does that look like? I would say um, it depends on, like obviously in spring and summer, people are moving, so it's more common. But on average, I would say if you're like consistent and dedicated, you could do anywhere from two to five a week. So just from an income perspective, also like you could do less couches, but just like raise the price higher, just all that kind of stuff. But we were making about 10 grand a month with couch flipping, especially during the summer when we didn't have school. Yeah, and gosh, so 10 grand a month, how many couches is that like ballpark? I would say, I'm thinking like 10 to 20, 10 to 20, okay. I'm gonna say yeah. 10 to 20. Wow, that's a lot of couches in a month. 15 couches a month, that's like a couch every other day, you know? Um, that's, a, that's a lot of volume. I didn't realize there were that many couches out there. And I, I wonder if it's like somewhat market dependent, you know, like it if is. you're, I would, you probably have to be in like a, like a bigger kind of city to get that kind of volume. Whereas if you're in a more like rural or remote area, like the, the volume of couches might be smaller. Like actually not like every house in your neighborhood is on like acres and acres. So like the density yeah. just isn't the same as like mine where I can see my neighbor's house out my window right now, you know? So I, I wonder what that what that looks like. Yeah, I agree. It is really market specific because we live like right outside Milwaukee. So there's a lot of couches for sale all the time. Josh, what does your income kind of look like on a bad month, a good month? And like, how long are you actually spending time driving and how many deliveries on average would you say? Yeah. When you, when you start out, you need to learn what orders are good to take and what aren't. So you can probably be around $15 an hour. Um, maybe 20 in the beginning, but as you kind of pick up the pace, you learn when to go right? The hotter hours during lunch and dinner, especially like more on the weekends versus weekdays. I mean, you can push 40 to $50 an hour pretty consistently. Um, of course, it is market dependent. I kind of did it in an area where there were like three main shopping centers with uh, five to 10, you know, restaurants at each. And I kind of just cycled through those. But it's kind of around, probably averages around like 30. So Josh, you said like you would cycle through the same restaurant. So were you, were you like friends with the people at, at like the local Johnny Carino's because they saw Josh coming in every other day or like was it multiple deliveries from the same restaurant on a daily basis? Like what what's the frequency at one location? Yeah, I mean, you could probably do like 15, 10 to 15 at one restaurant and almost just be like their delivery person during the entire day. Wow. And uh, bonus, you actually, if you start to make friends, they will give you the food that nobody picks up and you can get a bunch of free <laughs> lunch and dinner. I mean, I was, I had almost every single like major meal covered for free. <laughs> that, that's, that's another cost saving uh, tip there. They save money not having to pay for food or your meals. Well, that's awesome, guys. I want to bring you guys both in to kind of do a group discussion here. And maybe you guys have questions for each other too on your, your side hustles, but Looking back, is there something you would have done differently to make your side hustle maybe more profitable, maybe more passive or efficient? Uh, Ava, let's start with you. Yeah, so I would probably say that now we go, I we set like a, surf, a certain like profitability goal. Like for example, now if a couch isn't going to make us like 500 within the hour, we'll probably not get it just because we have like, you know, our other businesses now. So, um, yeah, we have like a goal, but now on average, 
Our couches make like anywhere from 500 to 1,000 for every like one to two hours because that's how long it takes to flip a couch. Um, but I would say I wish sooner I would have just gone for like the bigger fish because at first when a couch was priced at like $400, it would kind of be scary to buy. But now knowing what I know, I like wish I would have bought some of those couches because if it's a gray sectional and it's priced for 400, well, you could sell that for over a thousand. So you're still making a huge chunk of money. But I was just scared because it was just a lot of money. Like when I was used to getting couches for free. So I say like something I wish I knew sooner or now I know is just like, you don't have to be scared of like the bigger price couches just because they're higher priced. It's the same as like flipping a million dollar house and selling it for a couple more million. Ava, did you ever, did you ever lose money on a couch? Uh, we have, yes, we have, we've broken even before. Um, and a lot of the times it's cause like we were like 16 and really nervous. So like when the pictures looked really good and we would go to the house, like we would be scared to say like, Oh, never mind, I won't want it anymore. So we would just take it, which eventually <laughs> we learned to be like, no, but uh, yeah. So we have like those obviously are like majority of the times that's when we've broken even or even like lost like a hundred dollars or something, but losing money on a couch slip, it's very rare, but it does happen. Josh, I, I wonder for you, like, have you ever lost money on like, uh, like doing DoorDash? Like if you looked up your week and maybe like what you spent on gas didn't equate to what you actually made doing the deliveries. Has that ever happened? No, I wouldn't lose money that way. But um, sometimes you would be expecting like a cash tip, like this one delivery I drove almost an hour away from the store and it was catering. It was $350 in food. And I went in their house and I put it all, like I set it all up for their family and I didn't get a single dollar tip. Wow. And I was really annoyed. So there goes two hours of time for like 10 bucks. Yeah, I guess that's like how you lose money is that like your hourly rate goes down significantly. <laughs> so it's not worth, it becomes to the point where it's not worth your time, um, even though you're not physically losing money, but you're losing your time and it's not worth uh, the value. Okay, so do you guys have any questions for each other before we kind of close this out? I do. Do you have like a DoorDash hacker secret like that no one else knows that you think you like would be interesting to share? They do catering now, so I'm not sure how to sign up, but if you uh, you could just deliver catering orders, and I know one guy that does it, and he was doing really well. Um, multiple apps people don't really do that very often and then go on reddit and try to learn the tips like how they hide their tips um i'm not gonna explain it here but basically you can figure out like ooh, this one's gonna be like over 12 dollars or something like that josh i feel like the two phone thing and being able to be in two phones on multiple apps like because what there there's postmates there's doordash there's uber eats um, I guess, do you have a favorite between those? Like, like, do you, do you prefer DoorDash or, or like, have you tried Uber Eats or Postmates? Uh, I probably prefer Uber, Uber Eats to be honest, um, for it, I just, it's so market dependent in the hours. If you really get in the weeds on it. Dude, I, I wonder if you could be an Uber driver who does Uber Eats and Uber at the same time. So like you're picking up people, but then you're like, Hey, I got to stop by, you know, McDonald's, pick up this meal. And then you drop off the food in and the person. Uh, awesome. Josh, what about you? You have any questions for, for Ava on the couch flipping side? Definitely. Yeah. Um, how this is like a follow-up question after this, how often do you see like the same couch or one really similar? When I'm buying them, just like how often do I see like a repeat couch that I've seen before? Yeah. I'm asking because maybe you could like take like blank or template photos and then almost pre-sell them. We have done that. Nice. We have done that. We like oh, we got in trouble though. So one time, this one couch, uh, it went up on Facebook Marketplace and it was going crazy. Like everyone wanted it, but we got it first and we got it for like a couple hundred bucks. We made like a thousand dollars on this couch. But before we even got it, we just uploaded the pictures because it looked like kind of it looked gray in the pictures, which people like, but it's green in person. Like this kind of weird, like soft green, gray, but we put in the description, it's green. Don't worry. I wouldn't do that. But so, but we just like the pictures that she took just looked so much better. So we just like uploaded them and yeah, like everyone, since it was so popular, like people were trying to get it. Everyone's coming like, oh, someone already tried to post this for hundreds of dollars less. 
like, and then other people were commenting, like, appreciate the hustle kid. So, yeah, but um, we have reposted, like, the same pictures, but we haven't ever used, like, stock photos. Because usually people think those are, like, scams most of the time. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't take stock photos either. But, yeah, I like the idea of, like, hey, you know, maybe before you even get it, if it's the same couch. Like, if there's an Ikea couch that's, like, always selling in your neighborhood, then just having those photos might work. Um, well, Josh, Ava, both of you, I think, have given so much value to the rookie audience in terms of ways that you can – um, generate some additional capital to fund your real estate business. And like, like, uh, like we said at the top of the show, both of you were, were guests on, um, on bigger pockets podcast every year, episode 271, uh, Josh, you were 749 on the real estate show. So if anyone listening wants to go back and get their full backstory, uh, check out those episodes. But one, one final question before we let y'all go, uh, Josh, we'll start with you and then Ava will go, go to you. But if someone wanted to start your side hustle today, give me the, the 30 second, step-by-step game plan of how to get started if I want to do it this afternoon? Uh, make sure you have a car that's reliable, good tires, good brakes. Once you got that, sign up for as many apps as you can, use an actual address, use all the real information, and map out where you're going to try to focus on. Like, If you don't know your local area very well, like try to see where all the stores are and uh, hit those areas up. And then maybe even take like a day and kind of drive drive and walk through some of the restaurants and figure out which ones seem to be running efficiently and which ones aren't and try to focus on the ones that are quicker and uh, just get going. Ava, how about you? Download Facebook Marketplace. Make sure you have a truck or a truck you can borrow. Start making offers on couches. Get an offer accepted. Go get the couch and then take pretty pictures and upload it. Awesome. Thank you guys. Uh, one last question. Uh, how has this helped you guys with your real estate investing careers? Have you know you used money from the side hustle to purchase properties? Have you learned the actual valuable skills that have kind of translated into your real estate business? Ava? Yeah. So I obviously have used couch flipping to not only get my first rental property, but our second property was a short-term rental. And there's like 10 grand worth of just like you know, mattresses, decorations, like just housing supplies that you'd need in an Airbnb. So we like saved up 10 grand from couch flipping in order to buy all that stuff. Um, And then also just skills wise, like this was our first time ever, like, you know, doing like sales and making money and like negotiating. And I say like, we learned a lot of that. And also me and Ben are both kind of like more introverted. So this definitely like helped us crack out of our like shells and talk to people who we didn't know. So yeah. And Josh, what about you? It's a pretty good way of maybe being eligible for your first house hack if you do it for two years, because you can establish tiers of tight end income. And then you can also actually, I'm not a tax advisor, but you rack up a lot of miles and you can write it off and actually not pay that much in tax on the income. Um, But I basically used it to fund a few of my first deals. And I was able to listen to a ton of podcasts and books and set myself up a lot better for when I was ready to start making some investments. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Uh, Josh, can you tell everyone where they can reach out to you and find out some more information? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, Josh Janice on Bigger Pockets, and then uh, Josh Janice on Instagram. And Ava? Hi, I'm just Ava Jurgens on like Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. And you can just Reach out through DMs and then also Ava Jurgens on Bigger Pockets. Just really quick, if each of you can spell your last names just so people know how to how to find you, Ava, you go first. All right. So it's Y U E R G E N S. Cool. And then Josh? J A N U S. You guys can reach out to them to talk about side hustles or even real estate investing. Make sure you go back and listen to their episodes. We had Josh on real estate a podcast episode number 749 and Ava on the rookie podcast episode number 271. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Ava and Josh uh, provided a ton of value today with the side hustles. Thank you. Thanks. Well, that was really interesting, Tony, learning about those two side hustles. And you and I have the worst shiny object syndrome because we (laughs) both are already thinking, how can we make these work? (laughs) I'm going to have the biggest couch flipping business in America uh, by the end of the year. It it was really cool. I mean, Ava Ava and and Josh, I think both gave different perspectives. And I think what's so cool, Ashley, is that there's there's so many different ways you can fund your first deal. So there there are literally no excuses 
around why you can't get started in real estate investing because both Josh and Ava proved no matter what your age, no matter where you're at in your life, like with very little resources, you can start generating additional revenue to put towards your first real estate deal. Yeah. So we thought for this segment, we would kind of weigh these side hustles with three different elements. So the first one is what is the upfront capital? How much money do you need to start the side hustle? What is the income potential? How much can you actually make? And then is it passive or is it going to take up a lot of your time? What does that commitment look like? So as far as the upfront capital, I feel like these were actually very similar, the two side hustles. What I could see is that you needed a vehicle or access to a vehicle being kind of the main priority of these two side hustles. Yeah. And I'd say the majority of of folks listening to this podcast already have access to a vehicle. Only caveat is that, um, I guess with DoorDash, it it couldn't be more than 10 years old. And then with the couch flipping, you probably need a a truck or at least maybe like a minivan where you could like pop out the the seats or something. Um, But neither one required, you know, a significant amount of money to get started. So let me just quickly break down how how the scoring is going to work. So one would be poor, two would be average, and then three would be great. Okay. So if we give something a, a one, it means we're not super stoked about it. If we get something a three, it means we're, we're really stoked about it. So I think for the upfront capital, uh, Tony's at a three. I'm at a two just because you do need to have that vehicle expense. And with a vehicle it becomes, you know, paying for gas, it has maintenance on the vehicle that you have to maintain. So um, our next category is the income potential. So as far as um, these two different hustles, I honestly think couch flipping has a way greater potential at making money than DoorDash because I feel like DoorDash, you're kind of limited as to how much you can actually drive. And as Josh talked about, you can, you know, get really good at logistics and have two apps and or two phones and different apps on them and try to coordinate as best as possible. But it's still you physically having to go around and make these deliveries where couch flipping, I see it as there's, you know, a part of it where you're monitoring, you're negotiating online where it's not like physically having to drive yet to kind of work this business. And then you're going to pick up. And yes, there is a, a max as to how many couches you can actually pick up in a month. But with um, the couch flipping, it seemed that there was per a couch, there was a greater Ban or greater hourly rate that they were getting compared to to doing DoorDash. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that completely. I think that the upward income potential for the couch flipping, like Ava says, she's making ten grand a month, you know, flipping couches, and not to say that you couldn't potentially do that with uh, DoorDash and Uber Eats and Postmates, but the time commitment would probably be significantly higher to try and get to that level of income. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'm going to give couch flipping a, a three when it comes to the income potential, and I'd probably give um, Uber Eats a two. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think there's something else that we could kind of put into this category too, as to like your risk also. As to like DoorDash, there's not a lot of risk. You're not really putting up money up front where with couch flipping, you could be spending $400 to buy this used couch and then you sell it at a loss for 200 and now you're out $200 where with DoorDash, you may be out a little bit on gas money, but um, Josh said that's really never happened where he hasn't at least made back his gas money. But as far as his time, he might've driven somewhere and it ended up being $5 per an hour. <laughs> he ended up getting paid and making. So um, I think that it's important to kind of weigh that difference too. That's a great point, Ashley. Yeah. The, there's, there's no risk really to DoorDash because again, like all you got to do is jump in your car and maybe you spend yeah. a little bit of gas, but that's uh that's it. And also you're kind of, I would say you're more guaranteed to actually have business where couch flipping, it depends on what's being listed in your market, how well are you are at negotiating, how well you know what a couch sells for and what it's actually worth. So a lot of research and a lot of learning where DoorDash, you're given the business, it's there. Um, and you can take it above and beyond, like Josh said, and like really figure out the tip system. But at least you know you're going to get paid something for you know the standard rate from DoorDash. All right, I guess our our last category then is passiveness. And this is passiveness slash time commitment. Um, And I think both of them kind of have some pluses and minuses to each. Josh, with door dashing, I think the benefit from a time perspective is that 
you control when you work and when you don't. Uh, you know, like if you just want to do this around your day job and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm at work from, you know, nine to five and I'm going to door dash every day from five to eight, then you can commit to that time window. And more likely than not, you're going to be able to generate some revenue. Whereas with the couch flipping, like Ava said, you've got to kind of be monitoring that throughout the day because if you're late on the trigger, you could miss what is a really good deal. So I think from a flexibility standpoint, I do like door dashing a little bit more than the, uh, than the couch flipping. Yeah. And I think as far as like the research, the analysis, like DoorDash is a lot, I think a lot easier to like, let's just go and do it. And you're making money day one where couch flipping, you do have to actually learn and do some research on your market onto the value of a couch. And so I think like the time commitment of researching couch flipping and really understanding your market um, definitely can take up a lot of time, especially with just getting experience of buying and selling um, to get good at it and also negotiating. So as far as passiveness, I think um, mentally DoorDash may be more passive if you're just, you know, you have one app, you get the alert. OK, this is where you have to go pick up the food. Then you're delivering it where with couch flipping, you're kind of you have to really think, is this couch worth it? Is it going to be a deal? How far is it going to take me to pick it up? And all these different things that are, are, are kind of aligned with that. So I guess as far as passing passiveness, as far as time commitment, um, what, do you, what do you say your ratings are for that? Yeah, I guess just one one last thing to add on to that. I do also like, and we we just barely scratched the surface with this, but there is the ability with couch flipping to hire virtual assistants that can kind of uh, reduce that that time commitment yourself. So if you have a VA that's overseas and their whole job is to go through all of the Facebook marketplace listings, all of the offer up listings, whatever the little platform you can think of. And they're just monitoring that, looking for couches that fit your criteria. And then once they find something, it's all through the messaging apps anyway. So if they're just in that app and they're messaging for you. And then when they lock something in, then you're just going out there and picking it up and validating all that stuff. So, you know, obviously that's a little bit more involved, but I would say if, if we, if we exclude the virtual assistant thing, I would probably give the couch flipping a one mm -hmm. uh, just cause I, I think that there's a little bit more friction there. And I would give, um, I would give door dashing a two only because it, it is always tied to your own time. So I, I give couch flipping a one door dashing a two. And with the couch flipping too, cleaning, like that is your time cleaning. Uh, first of all, lifting the couches is physical labor. Cleaning the couches is, you know, the actual labor you're having to physically do yourself. I mean, with couch flipping, I think you could hire everything out and still make a little bit of profit at the end of it. But I think the people that are probably working for you are probably going to catch on. Like, why am I going and picking up these couches for somebody else? I can do this <laughs> myself. So. I can do it myself. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so thankful to have these two guests on today to talk about side hustles. Um, before we close out today, I do want to give a shout out to a real estate rookie, GFR Properties 19 on Instagram. Uh, he used the hashtag real estate rookie podcast. And I saw his post uh, where he actually used the Bigger Pockets calculator reports on biggerpockets.com. And he showed us a sample of an analysis he did on a property recently. And he said, as the market has been evolving, we have had to evolve our approach to find our next property. We are now looking for a small multifamily property to house hack as our learn loan terms will be more favorable as interest rates continue to go up. Then he asked for other people to comment as to different ways they are having to evolve or pivot their strategy and how they are analyzing deals. So go follow at GFR Properties 19. And if you guys want to submit a question, make sure you guys go to biggerpockets.com slash reply and submit your question or submit your side hustle so we can have you as a guest on the show. As always, thank you for listening. I'm Ashley at Wealth From Rentals and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson. And we will be back on Wednesday with a guest. Still